One of the things you actually have to do if you really want to understand the way that stars work is understand what kind of stars there are and how many of different types there are and so on because if you're going to come up with a theory of how stars form and evolve, it's got to match onto those observations. So you've got to do this sort of fairly pedestrian activity of actually just classifying the stars. So the, the Sun, for example, is, has its own classification and there's various different classification schemes that have been used, but the one that's in most common use nowadays uh, called the MK system, is that the Sun is classified as a G2V star. Stars are completely different. They range in size, in the amount of stuff they have, in the amount of density, in what type of stuff they have, if it's carbon or oxygen, and uh, they vary in temperature. The, the real problem in, in classification is that generally the classification gets done before you understand what it is you're classifying. That means that very often in astronomy you end up with a classification scheme which physically doesn't make a lot of sense because you just classify it on some fairly arbitrary basis at the time. It's sort of a historical nightmare as to how <laughs> stars are classified. They were originally just, you look at them and depending on how bright they are, you give them a number. So the brightest ones were one and then they went fainter to about five or six. And then it got a bit more techno technological when we were able to look at a spectrum of a star. So. If you shine the light of a star through a prism and you look at its rainbow, you can see different, different characteristics of a star, in particular hydrogen. And so a very sensible, what seemed a sensible classification scheme at the time was to classify all these spectra according to the strength of their hydrogen lines and various other lines as well, but mainly the hydrogen lines. And what they did is they, they had basically an, an alphabetical sequence starting at A, working their way through the alphabet, where A stars were the ones that had the strongest hydrogen lines and so on, B, C, D and so on, down through the classification scheme as the hydrogen lines got weaker and weaker and other lines got stronger. So about the mid-1800s is when this first started happening? It turns out that actually, physically, this isn't a very sensible way of classifying things because it's actually a, it's a, it's a Goldilocks and the Three Bears problem. And finally, Annie Jump Cannon, one of the first women who actually did astronomy, um, or is remembered for doing astronomy. She was the one who, who got very specific in the classifications of these stars. When the way you get strong hydrogen lines in the atmosphere of a star is that you, the star you know, is hot enough to kind of excite the hydrogen and then the, the, the hydrogen then is there to kind of absorb some of the starlight. And um, if a star is too hot, then the hydrogen all just gets ripped apart. It actually gets ionized, so the protons and the electrons that make up the hydrogen get ripped apart, and there isn't any hydrogen, there isn't any unionized hydrogen in the atmosphere, so you don't see any of these absorption lines. If the star's too cold, then the atoms are all in their ground state. In other words, the, the hydrogen atoms just never get excited at all, they never do anything, so they just sit there, they don't actually absorb any light. It's only a temperature somewhere in the middle where actually hydrogen lines get excited and you end up with these very strong hydrogen lines. So that's why hydrogen, you know, the, the, the stars that have these strong hydrogen lines are somewhere at intermediate temperatures. They're not too hot and they're not too cold. She kind of did away with the, the A through whatever letter it was because she realized there were characteristics that weren't just noticeable in the spectrum but related to physical properties of the star. You can use the same letters but you just need to rearrange them so that they're in temperature order rather than any other order. So instead of it being A, B, C, D, the order in which these stars come is O, B, A, F, G, K, M. So it ends up being O, B, A, F, G, K, M. And she just got rid of all the ones that kind of re repeated their properties. And that's not particularly a memorable collection of letters, but it's been, and the reason why I could just rattle it off like that is because it's remembered by generations of astronomers by a, a mnemonic, a way of a little sentence for remembering it. Uh, o, B, a fine girl, uh, kiss me is the traditional way of doing it. But there's other ones that people have come up with as well. Oh, be a fine guy, kiss me. <laughs> and I think there's a few other ones you can say, oh, be a fine girl, kiss me, if that's your liking. Oh, be a fine girl or guy, depending on your preferences, kiss me. And so, oh, be a fine girl, kiss me. O, B, A, F, G, K, M is the order in which these things are. And that's then ordered from the hottest stars, which are the O stars, down to the coolest stars, which are the M stars. The temperature basically determines a lot about what's going on with the star. And the temperature is correlated very closely with its mass. So more massive stars have generally hotter temperatures in their atmospheres, and lower mass stars have cooler temperatures. And mass and temperature have a lot to do with how long a star lives, how bright it's going to be, um, what kind of star it'll end up in eventually, either a white dwarf or a black hole. Why didn't they just change all the letters on the stars? Why did they keep the old letters? It's because it, you get stuck, right? You, you have a classification scheme and there's a whole bunch, so there was a huge catalogue, for example, um, produced in the 19th century of hundreds of thousands of stars that had all been classified by this scheme. 
And so rather than going through and reclassifying all the stars, the easier thing to do is just to remember a mnemonic for the right order to remember the letters in, rather than going back to hundreds of thousands of spectra and reclassifying everything. The Sun is sort of a typical star in the sense that it's in the middle of the uh, OBAGKM system. It's a G star, and its official classification is a G2V. Let's start at, the, uh, at the, the back end of it. The V is actually a Roman numeral 5, and all stars are classified according to their luminosity, with luminosity class 1 things being the brightest all the way down to luminosity class 5, and actually there's luminosity class 6, which is a little fainter, and occasionally white dwarf stars, which are even fainter, are called luminosity class 7. So the V at the end is just telling you how bright the star is. Then the other bit of it is telling you about its, effectively about its temperature. G is actually, it t tells you that it's, a, it's actually so, somewhere in the middle of the classification scheme, so the sun is not the, not the hottest star, not the coolest star, it's somewhere in the middle. Once you have a classification of a G star, you can even classify it farther and say it's a G0 or G1 or G9. So G0s are the hottest and G9 are the coolest. So among G stars, the sun is, is towards the hotter end, so it's a G2. But yeah, it, it's just a typical star. It's, uh, it's right in the middle of temperature range, right in the middle of the mass range. Um, it's, it's not the most common type of star, because the M and K stars are much more common. But it's a typical star in the sense that it just sort of straddles all the, uh, the possible ranges that we know of the stars. The neat thing comes when you actually start looking at collections of stars. So instead of looking at the properties of individual stars, you start looking at collections of them. So the first people to do this were a couple of astronomers called Hertzsprung and Russell. So there's a very famous diagram named after them. So this is uh, a very well-known chart. It's called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, named after the two people that used it. Um, so we have, going this way, brightness. So brighter stars are at the top. And we have, on this axis, temperature. And it's a bit backward, so stars get hotter as you go this way. You can see at the bottom, they have the classification, the O, B, A, F, G, K, M. And you see this nice diagonal line here. This is what's called the main sequence. So most stars spend most of their life on the main sequence. And this is where they are while they're burning hydrogen, while they're fusing new chemical elements in their cores. And then after some amount of time, and for our sun, it's about 10 billion years. We're already halfway through that, so we have 5 billion more. The, uh, the, the star will evolve off the main sequence and become a red giant. So, for example, the Sun in its distant future is going to turn into a red giant star, so it'll cease being a V star, a, a, a sort of low luminosity star, a main sequence star, and will become a giant star, so it'll be a luminosity class 1 or 2. And it will actually get cooler as it does so, it'll turn into a, a redder star, so it'll move down the sequence, so it'll stop being a G star and probably become a K star or even an M star.